Hey y'all, Data Guy here, and today I'm coming at you with yet another viewer request video, my favorite type of videos to make. And this time, what I want to go through is a workflow where we're going to take data from Postgres, transform it, uh, and then save it in Iceberg format, so in Parquet format, uh, in Snowflake Iceberg, just because he's an Iceberg solution and they just bought Iceberg, so you know why not use the new owners of it? Um, and also have that trigger of, hey, you know, when I'm going to pull that Postgres table be triggered by a Kafka queue. So I hope I got this right from the comments um, and I hope this is helpful to you out there. Um, but that's what I'm gonna show you how to do is build a DAG that is going to, you know, wait for a Kafka message to appear, take some data, process it, save it. Um, and so without further ado, uh, let's get into it. So here I am in my Azure CLI environment. So just local environment of Airflow. And the first thing is obviously we're gonna to need to add our requirements. So you're gonna need the Kafka provider. You're going to need a Snowflake provider installed, Iceberg. Um, and this is going to let us you know, both work with Iceberg objects, create them and then save them. Um, and then also Postgres SQL provider. This actually comes pre-built if you're using Astro CLI, but if you're not, uh, make sure you add it here. Um, and then also some data transformation dependencies. So pandas for obviously transforming data since one of the uh, restrictions was it couldn't, you couldn't use Spark for data transformations. So we're gonna use the, you know, do this transformation actually within Airflow. Um, and then Pi Arrow, which is just, you know, the interactive way for us to actually stitch our Parquet files into Pandas files. Um, so it makes that process really easy. They have integrations with Pandas. So you can take a Parquet file, manipulate it just as you would, you know, something like a data frame. Uh, also Pi Iceberg for the Python uh, functions that interact with Iceberg and you know will allow us to create those environments or those Iceberg format. Um, and then also the Snowflake connector with Panda support um, and also Snowflake SQL Alchemy. Um, and these are just tools we're gonna use within the Snowflake connector. So after that, we can start go creating our DAG. So let's create a new file. So Kafka Postgres uh, Iceberg.py um, and then start building out our DAG. And so as you do with every DAG, the first thing we're gonna be bringing in here are all of our different packages and requirements. So annotations to allow us to annotate certain objects in the logs, hash lib for us to create hashes um, and unique identifiers, um, JSON for interacting with JSON information, which obviously we're gonna use here, especially the XCOMs, logging for better interactivity with the logging mechanisms so we can populate the specific error messages to the UI or uh, to the logs in the UI, um, time delta, Classic need the ability to have you know delta time between two different periods. Typing any just gives us the ability to have different types. And this isn't really something that's super necessary, but it does it provide a lot of different types of conversion mechanisms for converting from one type to another. Um, then we have pandas, obviously pandas data frames. We're gonna be using those pretty heavily here. Pyero, Parquet for interacting with Parquet files via pandas. Uh, Pendulum for date time and setting now. And this is just, you know, Pretty much everyone uses this in Airflow DAX to set good date time uh, variables. Um, and then the Airflow SDK, we're gonna import data assets, DAGs, and tasks. So use all the three of those objects. Task groups as well, so we can group our uh, tasks more efficiently. Um, Airflow exception, Airflow skip exception for more graceful error handling. Base hook, and we're gonna use this just to initiate hook connections um, into you know Iceberg and, and uh, Postgres. Um, then variable, uh, we're going to save a lot of these kind of topics and things that we're gonna be using as variables, because that way you can just edit them in the UI and then have them take effect in the next DAG runner rather than needing to deploy a you know, hard-coded environment variable or you know, into the DAG itself. Then we have the await message sensor. And this is what we're using for detecting that trigger from Kafka. A Postgres hook, which obviously we're gonna use for hooking into Postgres. And then the Snowflake hook and operator for interacting with our Snowflake environment. So now that we have all those set up, we're then going to just initialize a logger under the name logger um, and then start setting up all of our different configuration here. Um, so here, what we're going to do is pull in either, you know, our, set our connection IDs as variables here. So Kafka default, Postgres source, Snowflake default, and we can just refer to these as the connection IDs. You could also just not do this and just hard code these values in, really personal preference here. Um, I just like this, so if I need to change it, I just change it once at the top of the DAG and I don't have to you know, change it for every single task that uses it. Then we have Kafka topic, again, getting that from a Airflow variable, the consumer group, getting that from a variable as well. Um, and then our Snowflake and Iceberg configuration, the database we wanna use, schema, and the table name and catalog you wanna use for Iceberg. Um, and here we're also always setting default values so that you're not gonna get a null value in case someone forgot to set a variable. Um, just again, best practices and better personal preference. Um, and then pipeline configuration as well, batch size, how much data do we wanna ingest? Um, and here, you know, what we're actually gonna do is add a couple zeros here because I know that 
you know, ask was for 20 gigabytes. Um, and really the only thing you need to do to make sure that you're able to handle 20 gigabytes is just make sure you have enough attached accessible uh, storage, right? So if you're using Astro, it's just a matter of selecting, hey, I wanna have 20 gigabytes of ephemeral storage um, and really any cloud provider that you're running Airflow on, you just, you know, say, hey, provision it with this amount of ephemeral storage per pod. Um, and then Airflow doesn't need, you know, isn't gonna need a ton of horsepower to do these computations, right? It just really needs that extra space and that's all you need to set. Um, and if you're you know, using open source, you gotta, just gotta change your pod configuration um, to be able to do that. Then we're also just gonna set a max Kafka wait seconds. So, you know, we have kind of a timeout in case no message appears in the queue. Again, you don't need to have this. It's purely preference. And, you know, if you want to make sure, hey, you know, I don't have a super long running DAG, but if you're using deferrable flag, uh, you don't need to worry about that. Um, and that's actually something I should note as well um, is, if you go to your environment variable here, you're going to also want to set. So here, you just wanna make sure you have this value, airflow operators default deferrable equals true. Um, and the reason for this is if you don't have it set to true and you're running that Kafka sensor that we're about to define, it's gonna consume a worker slot for that entire period of time versus if you do have this defined, it's actually going to be passed over to the triggerer node. Um, and that means that, hey, it's not going to need to consume that worker slot. The trigger is actually going to be taking that and the trigger can handle you know thousands of these type of sensor operations without taking up worker slots. Um, so if you were previously avoidant of using sensors for that, you should use this. Um, and then finally also here, what I just added is the Postgres asset. So a Postgres asset saying, hey, this is the source asset that we're uh, ingesting and the iceberg target asset that we're gonna be updating. Um, and these are making great use of latest and greatest airflow features, data assets. Um, and these essentially will create objects that then track all the changes to the, you know, over time. So every time the stack runs, it's gonna say, hey, you know, you ingested this table and it was of this shape um, and same thing for iceberg uh, and also especially on the iceberg piece, you could have this, or the Postgres piece, you could actually have this triggered from an upstream operation. Um, so you could say, hey, I have another table or this Kafka queue is going to update this uh, asset and then that's going to trigger downstream operation. Um, you know, in this case, I'm using a Kafka sensor, but it's just another way you could approach this. Um, and then for the iceberg target asset, this then will allow you to say, hey, anytime this asset is updated, trigger any downstream workflows that are depending on that Parquet file, right? So any ML jobs can take that data, consume it, and then start working on it downstream. Now we're also going to define a couple functions here. So the first one is a Kafka message filter. And this is basically going to say, hey, is this an expected message format that's going to alert me that, hey, my table has been updated and it's ready to go, right? Um, and so here, my expected message format is gonna say, hey, you know, the event type, source table, timestamp, et cetera. Um, and if it's valid and I detect, hey, this is a new piece of data that's ready, um, you can then continue pulling and continue the operation, right? Um, and so here, just handling different message formats. So handling, taking that JSON, converting the payload into a more readable format, validating that it has the required fields, validate that it has the data ready event. And obviously, you know, you're gonna need to customize this to whatever your Kafka message has, but here's the general kind of format you wanna have, just, you know, different if statements to detect, hey, does this Kafka message actually indicate that my data is ready to go? Um, or you, if you don't need a Kafka, you know, approval of the message, you know that anytime a message appears in this queue, you can just delete all these checks and not use them. Uh, but I thought it'd be useful in case you do wanna have that, because I've actually run into a lot of people that are using Kafka queues for different things. Um, and so having a check to say, hey, I wanna make sure that this actually means Postgres table is ready um, and ready to, you know, have this data moved out of it uh, into Iceberg, that's really useful. Um, so that's our function we're going to find. We're also going to now define our DAC. Um, so here, date, time, schedule, just all very standard, not interesting default arguments, um, except for the retry exponential back off and retry delay um, and execution timeout, right? So these are just saying, hey, you know, I have different execution timeouts if this pipeline runs for too long. Um, just make sure that, hey, you know, if the sensor gets tripped or there's some issue where, you know, task hangs, this task will fail out and this DAG will fail out too. Um, then our first task is just going to be a wait for Kafka trigger. So here we're using that await message sensor we imported. Uh, we have our await for Kafka trigger. We have bring out our Kafka topic, Kafka connection ID. Um, and then we're going to apply function and here the Kafka message filter. So that filter redefined. Um, we're going to use that to you know, apply that filter directly on the message ingestion or on the message sense. Um, hey, it does this fit our correct format. Um, we don't need any uh, arguments for that pass into it. And then here we have our pull timeout. So you're gonna to wanna to customize this based on how frequently you know, your data is being generated and how you know, long of a latency between generation and when you actually ingest it, you're willing to deal with. 
Um, and then also the seconds per, per, soul, per pull cycles. Um, that's also important to set here as well, depending on, again, your preferences. Uh, then our XCOM push key. This is so we can easily create an XCOM with a certain key and then save our value there. Um, just make it easier instead of using default uh, XCOM uh, key value pairs. Um, deferable equals true, right? If you don't have the deferral environment variable, um, you just set this here, but I do, so you don't actually need this. I um, just wanted to show that there's two different ways of setting it. Uh, then the max timeout for Kafka wait and a quick just description of what this Kafka message is doing or this Kafka sensor is doing so that anyone reading this code understands it. Um, and then our next task is going to be extracting data from our Postgres environment. So here we're going to define a new task with the Tassel API uh, because we're going to not just use Postgres but actually do a little customization here. Um, and so here we're going to you know, basically say, hey, extract this data set. Um, so get this message, which is going to tell us our source table. Um, and then we're going to get a batch ID. So this is going to allow us to track hey, how many batches have actually been created and assign a unique identifier. So if we need to go back and look at a previous batch, you have that option and it's really easily available. Then we're going to initialize a Postgres hook. I'm going to define our query here of you know what we want to extract right here saying, hey, this is our batch ID source table that was given to us in that Kafka queue. Um, and then we're going to extract this to a pandas data frame. So here we're using the Postgres hook, feeding that output into a get pandas data frame function, um, and then saving that as a data frame. If it's empty, you know, this is just a check against null values and bad data, we're going to throw an exception. Otherwise, we're going to print out the number of records, just so you have that information available in the logs, um, and then store that as a parquet file. Um, and this is going to be very efficient for inner task transfer. And again, if you're using uh, you, you're going to want to set up a custom XCOM backend for this. Um, so that is very easy. It's just a couple lines within, again, the environment file, uh, environment variables file. Um, and it is just one second. So here you want to make sure you have your XCOM backend set to, you know, whatever you're going to be using. So here, uh, XCOM object storage backend, and then your actual path to your S3 bucket or whatever connection you're using for actually storing your XCOMs. Um, and this allows you to basically pass infinite, uh, you know, size of data between tasks, obviously still limited by the amount of ephemeral storage attached to each task that's going to take that data in, but you're using object storage, right, which is, it's a cloud service, it's pretty much infinitely scalable for most intents and purposes, obviously some edge cases that you can call me out on there. Um, but this is the crux of this whole operation, right? Is you know you, you have use the XComs as a really uh, easy way to pass this data between tasks, and then just transform it via Airflow, and use the attached object storage to actually you know handle the storage of the data as it moves through your data pipeline. So here we're going to return you know temp path, source table, just a lot of the high level characteristics of the job we just or the data we just extracted, um, and then you know we have our uh, temp path it pointing to our parquet file that we saved here. Um, and you could also just return the parquet file as well. So if I wanted to just return, you know, something like data frame, um, you could do that too. But this is just another option here if you want to save it into uh, S3. So here, then our next task is going to be then um, actually moving and taking our data and converting it uh, and doing some transformations within, within Airflow. Um, so here we're going to use pandas and do some basic data uh, transformation on it, you know, some data validation, um, and just showing you, hey, you don't necessarily need Spark for non-complex workflows. Um, and so here we have our task, right, transform uh, with pandas. Um, and so here we have our task ID, um, you know, transform pandas. And then our function here is basically just reading in that temp path, batch ID, reading that parquet file, and again, using pandas, uh, getting an initial count, just making sure that has the right amount of data and making that available there. Um, and then standardizing some column names here, you know, thought of some basic data quality checks you could run. So, you know, replacing, uh, you know, under, lowercase or snake case, defining logic for how you're going to handle null values, right? You know, keeping maybe numeric nulls for iceberg compatibility. Um, also adding metadata columns for iceberg. This is really important, you know, having good metadata when you're dealing with iceberg because it's typically in conjunction with the data lake, which requires really good metadata to not turn into a data swamp. Um, then we're going to, you know, drop some duplicates if you are worried about duplicate values, um, do some basic data quality validation here, um, and, you know, failing if there's too many nulls in critical columns. Um, and then here we're going to save this transformed uh, data to, again, a parquet file. Um, and so here you can see df dedupe, just, again, saving this to local storage, or you could convert this to saving it to object storage um, or to an XCOM and then returning the transform path, batch ID, record count validations, and schema as well. 
Then our next task is now going to be loading this data to Snowflake as an iceberg table. Um, and here it's actually not going to be one task, but a sequence of tasks we're going to go through with a task group. So here we're going to define a task group here, um, which is just you know loading Snowflake into Iceberg. Um, and so here we're basically creating our first task in this group is going to be just getting that data, ensuring that Iceberg table exists. Um, so here just mapping our existing data types to whatever our Snowflake data types are. So corresponding mapping. If worried about mapping, I also created a whole other video on this. Um, and then we have columns. So just making sure, hey, all those different columns for our different, uh, you know, our Parquet file are converted into the corresponding Snowflake columns, right? Because Postgres uses different data types from Snowflake. Then we're going to create table uh, if it doesn't exist. So, you know, just to check in case, hey, you know, if you maybe want to use this workflow to create multiple different po or convert, merge and transform multiple different Postgres tables, I've kind of designed it that way, right? So, you know, because all those variables are set at the top, right? Each time you run this, you know, you could be sending a Kafka message with a different table. So, this is basically saying, hey, if a table doesn't exist, we're going to create a new one. Um, so you have compatibility, whatever direction you want to choose. Then we're going to initialize a Snowflake hook, execute that query. If it fails, we're going to send a log message saying it's failed. Otherwise, just you know, say, hey, this has uh, succeeded, and returning the transform result. Um, and then down here, what we're going to do is stage data into Snowflake. So we can't upload data directly into Snowflake. We need to stage it. Um, so here we're taking our transform data, initializing a Snowflake hook, and creating a stage. Um, and then we're creating a stage with SQL here, um, and then running that with the Snowflake hook, and then uploading that file to stage with the put command. Um, you could also use the Python connector directly, um, but this is just kind of what I'm used to doing, and it's pretty easy to do. Um, and then you have Snowflake hook, get a connection, create a cursor, and then execute this statement where it's going to take this data and then update it in, or load it into Snowflake's uh, out of the box staging environment. If you are using a different type of staging environment like S3, not really much of a change here, um, just changing out the path and, and the connection. Um, and then returning the transform result and the stage path as well here. Um, so now we have the merged uh, stage parquet data. Um, we're going to want to take all that parquet data we put in staging and merge it into an iceberg table. So here we're going to use merge um, for item potent upstart operations. So getting our st stage path, batch ID, record count, creating a snowflake hook, and then two options here, depending on what you want to do. If it's just a simple insert, you just run this statement. Otherwise, you could also use a merge for upserts, um, and this will just make sure you know you have better uh, uniqueness checks. And uh, if there's especially there's a table without a primary key or for initial uh, loads, merges you know you can't use an insert. You need to use a merge. Um, then down here we're gonna say hey we loaded this amount of uh, rows, this amount of records, clean up that staging uh, area so we're not paying for storage there, um, and then returning the high level attributes of hey, this is where it's saved now as an iceberg table, um, and it was completed at x time. Um, and then down here, we're just changing the task group. So each of these are just basically feeding off of each other. So once the table is ready, then that data gets staged into Snowflake. And then once the data is staged, then it, that data gets merged into an iceberg table. Um, then we have this return action at the end to break the uh, task flow or the task group loop. So then all we have left to do is just basically setting our bitmapping for this operation. Um, and we're not going to use bitmapping. We're going to use uh, outputs, right? So here we have our Kafka trigger. It's taking that output, storing it at a Kafka message. And then this is going to then allow us to feed that information into post the Postgres task, feed that into the pandas task, feed that into the Snowflake uh, task group, um, and just doing that really easily without needing to do bitmapping. And then also, you know, XCOM passing. This will just automatically pass the XCOMs between different tasks. And then just instantiate the DAG. Um, and that's really all you need to do here. So I hope that whoever requests this video found this helpful. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Data guy out.